I'm United States Senator John Barrasso, and this is The Elephant in the Room. Thank you, Senator Barrasso, our chairman. This is The Elephant in the Room, and I'm your host, Cyrus Pearson. I'm a 22-year staffer on Capitol Hill, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Christy, a woman who spends more time researching issues than the U.S. spends debating whether or not to shoot down spy balloons. Thanks for being here, Christy. Hey, Cyrus. Thanks for having me. We had a great guest today. So much to talk about. Could not possibly get to this all. We could have done two, maybe three hours with him. Easily. He had one heck of a story and has one heck of a story. He's an undefeated MMA fighter with a kickboxing wife and six kids who all wrestle. He's a plumber turned U.S. senator, up here, I assume, to snake out the scum. And he's got a plan to restore America to energy independence. U.S. Senator Mark Wayne Mullen from Oklahoma. He spent 10 years in the House and joins us as of 2023 here in the Senate. Christy, your thoughts on the interview. One of the things that I found uh, really remarkable about him is he talks about how he had that wrestling injury and then basically in the blink of an eye went home, you know, took over a plumbing business. And you just hear about this person who was given immense responsibility at a moment, you know, when there, I think he said he was 20. And you see a person who rose to the occasion and has answered the call of building a family, building a career, building a community. And it makes you feel, I don't know, I feel good knowing that you have someone like that here in the U.S. Senate who at every sort of challenge that he's met says, what can I do about it? And what are options to make it better? And I think that that's something that really came across in the interview. The authenticity is off the charts, wouldn't you agree? Oh, in- incredible. And the passion he brings when he talks about uh, energy in America near the end of our podcast, you really can hear. The way he can just talk about the issue with total dexterity and the way he understands sort of you, you can't mandate your way into innovation and that the U.S. has the ability to do it, unleash American energy, but also produce it cleanly, domestically and create jobs. I think it's an important thing to remind people. It's a good thing to, to say, and he, he certainly has expertise in that issue. And we're not saying this because he can beat us up, which he can. <laughs> he certainly can. All right, with no further ado, let's get into today's The Elephant in the Room, U.S. Senator Mark Wayne Mullen from Oklahoma. Senator, we'll get into the juicy stuff in just a minute, but uh, first, would you describe yourself as a morning person or an evening person? Morning, 100%. How early do you get up? Uh, 4.52. 4.52. I don't... I- I uh, I heard somewhere that you uh you have a workout breakfast club on the house side every morning. Is six that... six thirty in the morning we meet. Uh, I meet the house guys uh, at six thirty, and it's been going on for thirteen years. When it first started, I had Paul Ryan, Ken McCarthy. Uh, uh, we had um, uh, Christy Nome, Tossy Gabbard, Joe Kennedy. Wow. Uh, that was just Seth Moulton. Just I mean just. Jason Smith. There was about twenty of us. And then at one time, I had when Martha McSally and Kirsten Cinema was running against each other. They were both in my workout group <laughs> when they were running against each other. And so I came up with a rule that if you talk politics, because they would bicker at each other, I was like, all right. Anybody talks politics from now on, we're doing burpees, and I would do burpees until they quit talking. <laughs> <laughs> that will fix that. Yeah. So, well, on the uh, so that that actually was one of uh, the questions that I had because burpees reminds me of um, this thing I hate called CrossFit. Yes. But I gotta I gotta ask you uh, where where are you? so for me CrossFit is sort of the ideal white collar prison workout, but yeah. other people swear by it. Where I'm not a CrossFitter. No, I'm not a CrossFitter. I do circuit training. Okay. And uh, so I got into doing circuit training when I uh, when I was fighting. We were, you know, when I was fighting, it was just became a sport, you know, right? It, it was it was really shoot fighting, mm-hmm. and then we'd fight tournaments, uh, and then this, you know, they decided to make us professionals. And so when we decided to be professionals, we thought we may want to train like professionals because until then we were just like we just bang it out. I mean, literally, when I mean bang it out, we would just show up at the gym and just kill each other and that was called practice and so crossfit came in Mm -hmm. i mean literally crossfit came right in the middle of all that and we we tried it for a little bit and i didn't like it i didn't like the way it 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 made my shoulders and all this stuff so we started doing circuit training and i carry a lot of that same stuff i just eliminate the punches and the kicks and all that stuff with bags out and we just so it's real circuit it's one hour and we get after it and what we'll typically i put things in boxes so there's four boxes and each box will have three to four sets in it, and you go, you do each box three times, and uh, it'll take it takes you an hour to go through it. Someone would do done in forty five minutes, but it, you can get done in forty five minutes, but you're going to be 
breathing hard. So it's like a cardio lift. Sort of, sort of. That sounds like the the McKinsey approach to uh, you have, if you have the four quadrants. Uh, True, <laughs> I guess. I'm just not a fan of McKinsey, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. that's fair. Fair. Well, I could tell you weren't a CrossFitter because you're not constantly talking about CrossFit. <laughs> Follow up to the first question: so What true. time do you end up going to uh, bed at night? Uh, I I actually go to bed pretty late too, so I only sleep about four or five hours a night. Okay. I try to go. I like to be asleep by uh, by twelve thirty. Um, or definitely in bed by 12:30. Last night I got to bed at 1:30, uh, and so uh, I get I do fine with three. I like four, uh, five is five is prefer. But if I do six, honestly, I get a headache. My wife tells me, of course, my wife and I we've been married 25, almost 26 years, and been together since third grade forever. But um, she tells me her next husband will wake up with her. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's insane, and we'll find out throughout this podcast, the amount of things you do on that little amount of sleep. Let's talk about your wife and your kids for just a minute, and then we're going to get into some MMA stuff. Uh, how many kids do you have? Six. Uh, I tell everybody my wife couldn't leave me alone. She reminds people. I, she, she says she always rolls her eyes when I say that. And I was like, I tell people all the time I had a headache and I just didn't feel good. And uh, but she <laughs> she rolls her eyes and she says, Yeah, but three of them are adopted, Mark Wayne. Uh, so the way I describe that though is three we got stuck with and three we chose. So you choose which one we love. You, you pick which one we love the most. <laughs> and and how what's the age range? Because I have a four year old yeah. and a sixteen month old, and it is tough. So a nineteen, eighteen, seventeen. Those are the boys. Okay. Uh, the uh, the girls are 14 and twins that are 12. Our bookends are the ones that uh, we adopted. So Jace is the newest addition. We've had him going on six years now. He's 19. And then the twins are 12. And uh, we were fortunate enough to have them in our lives uh, for a little over 10 years now. Wow. Congratulations on yeah. all those kids. Uh, Mark Wayne Mullen, Senator from Oklahoma, is our guest on The Elephant in the Room today. Let's talk MMA because all the senators who come in here, I am six foot four, but that does not mean I'm tough, come in and the first thing they say since you've been elected, so you think you could take Mark Wayne Mullen? <laughs> Obviously not. Obviously not. Let's get that out of the way. Uh, you talked a little about this earlier. I'm a couple years older than you, and MMA was kind of coming out when I was growing up as well. I didn't really have appreciation for it, but then I took a Krav Maga, the right. Israeli street fighting martial art, for a couple Great. years. I mean, that is the, one of the best self defense. Love they are. It. It's awesome. One of the things Those guys got it figured out. Oh yeah, uh, my first. Uh, I'll tell a little story. We may have to edit this out if it's too boring. First day in there, uh, they ask you to pair up. I didn't know anything about it, so I turn around. Only person left is a ninety-five pound, five foot two girl. I'm six foot four, two ten at the time. They give me a pad that goes from my shoulder to my knee. They have me hold it. They blow the whistle, and she beat the living stuffing <laughs> out of me for 30 seconds straight. Elbows, knees, fists. It was crazy. And that's the moment I decided I will never attack somebody because you never know what they know. That's right. That's but right. the point is not that a girl can beat me up. The point is I got an appreciation. My wife's a second degree black belt. And she can take Well, she me can up. take me. She can take me, no doubt. Uh, the point is... As I went through Krav Maga, I started to realize it's more of a physical chess game. It's not two guys just hammering on each other. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think martial arts is a it's a it's a disciplined sport, right? You have, especially if you go to places that aren't a factory. So the ones that are belt factories, they they give you a lot of self uh, false confidence. If you go to a real martial arts uh, place where it'll take you nine years to get your black belt. Um, you build a confidence, but you build a self-control confidence too, right? I, I was a pretty hot-headed kid growing up. I, I, my dad told me at 17 I was either going to end up in prison or end up in uh, or end up successful. I was a I never drank, never used drugs, but I was a fighting fool. Uh, my 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 temper was my was my adrenaline. That was my okay. drug, right? And, uh, and and if you if you gave me the finger going down the road, I got giddy because, buddy, if you'd pull over, I was going to make you eat your grill. Okay. I mean, I, I was I, I was just stupid, but it's what it was. I, it's dumb. No wonder I didn't get shot. I got I'm not saying I didn't have is, issues, but um, I fast forward. I get into martial arts. Uh, I, uh, I start fighting. Um, I'm not fighting. I'm not considered a professional yet because it wasn't a professional sport. And uh, I was at a car wash. And this guy flipped me off, and he was mad. He stepped out of his car, and I was like, 
I'm not fighting you for free. This is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get paid to fight. And I just I just looked at him. I was like, you're an idiot. And that's all I said is you're an idiot. And Christy looked at me and she's like, who are you? But I didn't feel the need, right? I, I That, that uh, adrenaline or those endorphins that you get out of your system when you go to class – you don't, it just is a calming effect, right? Uh, when I used to have the worst days, I wanted to go spar. The, the day, when we shut down, I'll share this quick story too. When we shut down um, in 2013, mm-hmm. do you guys remember that? And yeah. it was awful. I mean, it was the, it, it, my first year here, knives were drawled. Uh, the, it was underneath Speaker John Boehner. You had the Freedom Caucus. Everybody was just at each other's throat. Uh, not to mention we were getting trashed by Obama. I mean, he had outmaneuvered us. Um, he had control of the media. The media was just harassing us, even though they'd shut down all the monuments. I mean, it was just awful. And so it was that it, 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 the tension was like that, too. At that time, Kevin had wanted to learn boxing. And uh, and we were boxing every night. Him and I, Speaker McCarthy, Kevin I guess McCarthy, I should say, yes. yeah, Speaker McCarthy. He was wanting to learn boxing, so him and I were boxing every night. He's actually really athletic. Surprise! I mean, he's actually extremely athletic. Really? Yes. And uh, but he never boxed. He never threw hands at all, and it was just awful. <laughs> and so we were we were training him, or I was training him. And uh, the night we opened back up, I grabbed Kevin and I said, "Hey, uh, let's go spar." I mean, this is like at eleven thirty at night uh-huh. because I wanted that tension out and he needed that tension out and he looked at me and said are you serious i said it's the best thing for us so we go down to the to the house gym uh, they got a mat there i put a circle on the mat and i tied our feet together and i said we can't leave this circle this is some Roman and he stuff. goes he goes he goes what he said i said you can hit me anywhere and i can only hit you from the from the shoulders down he said deal it was the best therapy ever, although he, he had Velcro gloves on, and he came across my nose and cut all the hide off my nose. And I was bleeding like a stuck pig. The next day, we show up at the house floor, and he is telling everybody he broke my nose. But my point on all that is is that it was a, it's, a, it's a way to release. And so when you're in – don't, you don't feel the need. You learn to breathe. You don't feel the need to get angry. There, we got a lot of things in this world that get you angry. And don't get me wrong. I still have a temper – but my temper now gets focused. Like I get very extremely focused. I don't lose my temper where my ears turn red and I just, rah, and I go off. And martial arts did that for me. It is, it is, it's amazing at what it go and do. And people, I, I, I used to, when we had our own gym, I had a youth sanction board that I worked with and they would send me young kids with bad temper. And I'd work with them all the time. Uh, all the time constantly working with them and you'd see their temper go away when they were in there because they were getting that release whatever that it's kind of ironic that that's the route to kind of calm someone down and that is one of the questions i was going to ask you is if you recognize the advantage of uh what the vast majority of people don't have they can defend themselves physically and know it so it kind of opens up more so you can use your mind absolutely you don't panic yeah like um, I've never been one to panic anyways, but you don't panic in situations. You just kind of go, all right. Let's talk about something else. You were a plumber uh, starting out. Right. Uh, you started off, you went to college. Uh, tell us a little about that. Well, um, so I, I have a great relationship with my parents. I'm, I, I, I'm the youngest of seven, and people say, how did you learn how to fight? And I said, out of necessity, because my sisters used to beat the thunder out of me, <laughs> and they were not babying me. Well, at 15, I moved out, and uh, I, I moved out of the house, and my parents let me go. I'm thinking, I got teenage boys. I'd never let them go, but it was really, and my dad says it wasn't an option for you because you were going to go. Still had a great relationship. It wasn't like this bad situation. I was just independent and at a small house, a lot of people. And, uh, but uh, my dad was sick. My dad was very ill at that time and we couldn't figure out what was going on with him. And uh, he had a small plumbing company. That plumbing company uh, was, had had success, but it was, it was coming down pretty hard. Um, I had opportunities to go wrestle all over the country. I was, uh, I was a little bit better than average and uh, I wasn't no Jim Jordan, but I was, I was pretty good. And he, um, uh, I took a scholarship. I had to go to a different school because I got hurt my senior year, blew my shoulder out, long story. I ended up taking a school, going to Missouri Valley up in uh, in AIE school. Um, Oklahoma State, Nebraska wanted me to go get healthy, come out, and then choose which school to go to after that. And uh, while I was there, I tore all my guts out. Uh, I had, uh, okay. I, uh, because I had shoulder surgery, and then I ripped my shoulder back out, and I wouldn't go get it fixed. And so I was overcompensating. 
and I didn't get a hernia. I tore the lining. And so the lining that holds everything together, I had hurt and I kept going. I, it's stupid, but I got a really high, high, high pain tolerance. I got one son that's just like it. And so if he gets hurt, if I get hurt, hurt means you're going to the hospital. Hurt right. doesn't mean I sprained my ankle. Yeah. Hurt means you're having surgery. It's hurt means you've got something filleted open. And you're going to get a bunch of stitches. That's hurt for him and I. And um, and I, I, I something was wrong. And when they went in, they x-rayed me. They was like, you've tore the lining all out of your stomach. I mean, not not the lining in your stomach, but what holds everything together, like all the muscles and the mesh. It's all that you tore that all up. There's there's two ways to to fix that. We go in, we've got to literally sew it all back together. But it run, it can really damage your muscles when you do that, or you can set out for two years. So I decided to set out for two years. Well, right when that happened, I say it's a Lord thing. Right when that happened, my uh, my dad called and he said he needed help. Okay. He, he, the company was in bad shape, and uh, he he said I need some help, and I was like, you know, I'm not going to sit here for two years. I can come back to college. I'm going to go home, and uh, I I did not home, but I went to Tulsa, not back to the not to the ranch, and I got there and I realized I was homeless. This is a true story. I was like, I don't have a place to live. I was living in a dorm. I was living in a barn. I left my barn when I went to college, and uh, Christy had an apartment, but I didn't want to live with her because I knew her parents wouldn't like that, and my parents wouldn't like that because we was raised in a very traditional family. Right. I was like, hey, maybe I got a good idea. Let's get married. <laughs> So, <laughs> 19 years old, she was 18. I'm not saying I make great decisions in life. And uh, so we got married, and right after we got married, my dad got really sick. And he goes, I'm done. And uh, he says, if you want the company, you can have it. Well, that day, uh, there was just a handful of employees. I mean, like four employees, and two of them was Christy and I. I inherited $500,000 of debt. Mm. 250000 immediately passed due, and then my dad had borrowed money trying to keep the business afloat. Everybody around me was telling me to file bankruptcy, and I, was, I, I wasn't even signing on a checkbook. I didn't own a checking account. I didn't know how to make a check out. Right? Yeah. I mean, I paid cash for everything. So I went from nothing to all of a sudden being a business owner, and I didn't know what accounts receivable was. I didn't know what the payables was. I, I didn't have any. I mean, you're talking about being thrown in the fire. I had no idea. I went from one day just being a plumber to the next day owning a company that had a lot of debt. And, man, I didn't know what to do but work. My dad taught me how to work, and I went to work. And so for three years, her and I had one day off. I'm talking about one day. I'm not talking about Saturday, Sunday. I mean, one day, three years, 365 days a year. Uh, we took February 15th of 98 off. That was that was our very first day to ever take off in three years. How do you remember that day? Is it just that it was so poignant, <clears throat> or was it specific? No, it was the specific day that I got current with all my bills, because we were we were on COD everywhere. Mm -hmm. We were on COD getting gas, getting supplies. I had to take a check every single day to the supply house. I had one supply wow. house called Win Nelson, and that kept me that kept us supplies. Today, they're our largest supplier, and we been millions of dollars a, a year millions of dollars a year through them right now and that you're talking about a good investment for them right mm -hmm. uh, at that time we were doing like 15,000 a month but they kept me they kept us supplied but I had to take them a check every day I had a guy named SK who had a Sinclair station uh, that was a total station and it was a Sinclair station they gave me credit every day he was uh, from Iran actually and I would take him a check every day that was the only way I could get gas I, I'm a, at this I'm a 20, just barely 20 year old kid, and I had these people extend me credit. Uh, I had a banker named Preston um, Lee who extended me a credit line at 20 years old. And you he, had to go work these credit. things out yourself. Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, you just had to go man to man. To I didn't have a choice and say, "Hey, you know, can can you help me? I'll help you." My as my dad said, my dad apologized and he says, "Mark, when I had to raise you till you're 18, you got to raise me the rest of your life." He was very ill. Uh, hardest working man you ever met in your life. Still, he's he's still with us today. He's seventy six years old. Still works his butt off every day, but he works and takes a nap. Then works and takes a nap. But he still works. He can't sit still. Uh, my dad and I are very very close, very close. And uh, but that's why February fifteenth, I got current with my bills. It was the first time I had got everybody paid off, and now I just got to pay on the debt. And uh, and so I call. I told Christy, I said, let's take the day off. And we literally got a map. We were living in an apartment. I went to, we went to Walmart Supercenter, so get a map, and we flipped a coin and said east or west. West came up, and the closest place we'd go was Angel Fire, New Mexico, and went and skied a half a day and came home. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great celebration. 
There's so many places we could go with this, uh, but one of the things I want to talk about, let's maybe change somebody's life out there. People don't necessarily need to go to college, and maybe someone out there isn't working, isn't sure exactly what to do with their lives, or they have a kid right. like that, or a friend or a cousin. Um, I think the next big thing that's going to change things is AI. It's going to change the media. It's coming down the pipe. Mm. It's going to replace jobs. Plumbing is recession-proof. Uh, there's always going to be a need for that. Uh, this is a viable path to establishing a profession in the U.S. What are your thoughts on that? And you get paid well, as you train, don't you? Sure. So plumbing for me, and to be quite frank, I never wanted to be a plumber. Uh, I'd probably say I was a little bit embarrassed about um being a plumber i mean i was went from a college athlete my wife was cheering in college uh mm -hmm. to where i'm a i'm driving around a plumbing van i had a 1979 plumbing van with three on the tree if you don't know what i'm talking about being three on the tree it's where the gear shift is instead of being on the floor it's on the tree and uh, that's why i call it three on the tree uh with all my buddies that are going to college right they're all yeah. having fun and i'm w working but I wanted to change that to professional uh, setting, and she wanted to, too. And so my wife had this vision about it, and then, of course, I, 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 I did, too. But she sees the pretty, and I just see the work. And, um, and so we started working on that. We wanted to make them technicians. We wanted to bring pride to it. Okay. We didn't want a junkie yeah. truck. We wanted the best truck. We didn't want them to be running around in white T-shirts and overalls. We wanted uniforms. Uh, we, in fact, we had a saying that my guys are going to show up every day with their belt tucked or with their shirt tucked in, belt around their waist, and shoe covers on their feet. If not, your first hour is free. That's what I mean. That's what I advertise over and over again, and get it caught on. And uh, that one company obviously grew up, and now we have over 300 trucks. And now, now actually, we have uh, we're I'm part of a buyer group now that uh, our company has. Is we have 300 something locations all across the country. Uh, but we started electrical. We started HVAC. Uh, we started uh, doing trades trim carpentry anything that touched us and the trades went from used to when i first started was making seven bucks an hour mm. I, I, you couldn't hardly live off that right right now my average technician in oklahoma makes over a hundred thousand a year that's you're like wow. the one percent in oklahoma i mean that's that's crazy it's better than a lot of people on the hill up here yeah, I mean that's 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 what the after three years of apprenticeship, that's what you're making. You're making over a hundred grand a year. You're making between a hundred to a hundred and twenty five, hundred and thirty grand a year, and uh, and that's just you by yourself. If you start building a crew underneath you, that those numbers escalate very very quick. Uh, plumbers get paid more than electricians, and uh, and HVAC guys get paid more than electricians. Electricians are your lowest paid, but still, my electricians make seventy five to eighty thousand a year. And then, then HVAC guys are a little bit, a little bit more than that. And then you take your trim carpenters, you got your cabinetry guys. We do custom cabinetry. We do all we do. My part, my point on the plumbing part of it, it started with plumbing, but plumbing on a new construction or remodel, we're the first in and last out. So plumbing's got to go in before concrete goes down, right? Mm -hmm. And then after everybody gets done, we got to go in and set. So the cabinetry, and everything else, we got to go in and set the trim. The last thing you set on top of a cabinet is your sink. Right. So everything else has got to be done. Well, if one of those trades in front of me failed because they have horrible management, then it would cause me to be behind and then throw my schedule all off. So we started buying up all those trades we worked with just because I could control them at that point. I know that sounds silly, but trades is, a, I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity. Now, I ended up going back to school because I got asked to be on a on Oklahoma State's board, and I was like, I can't be on your board. I never graduated from college. And so <laughs> they said, well, we'll give you an opportunity. And when I went back to school, I was like, this is crazy. My first assignment in comp class was to go, when my first assignment, when I went to college, my first time, was to go to the library, get onto a computer, go to an inbox and drop a message. Okay. And I had to print out the paper. And when I printed out the paper, it was a ching, 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 that you tear the edges off. Okay? Right. Then I go back and everything's done online. And I was like, well, this is weird. <laughs> but, you know, you don't have to go, obviously, you don't have to go to college to be successful. And I, I tell people this all the time. I hire on the sense of responsibility over, over, um, uh, over your, your education. Because if you have that sense of responsibility, you'll learn whatever it takes you, to do your job. You, you'll work hard enough to figure it out. But I also preach that an education is something that can never be taken away from either. But an education is a trade. If you learn a trade, that's an education you'll always be able to work. 
but you have to be educated. You, 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 whatever it is, become a professional at it, and that knowledge will never leave you. You can lose your marriage. You can lose your finances. You can lose your boat. You can lose your house. You can lose everything. But an education on whatever it is that you decide to learn can never be taken away from you. It's with you forever. Great advice. Let's talk about things are going right for you. How did you get involved in politics. Uh, you know, we have here that you got involved because the EPA was giving your business a hard time and you got fed up with the federal government. Is that true? Yeah. So um, we did, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I was non-political at all. Never watched Fox News, CNN, anything. The only thing I ever listened to, and you guys, some of the listeners will know this, was Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. Uh, yes, it, it, yes. Came, it came on at 7.30 and 12, uh, at 7.30 in the morning and 12 uh, at noon. And that was the only political thing I got, period. I, but uh, we had a company that uh, we had developed the ability to help rural municipalities take their their potable drinking system and become compliant underneath the Obama era. You know, they were making a big issue, Obama or a big push to build new drinking stations. I mean, they were making a huge push. You know, m rural areas. It was their shov shovel-ready job. It was called infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is, if you're not from rural Oklahoma or rural America like I am, you can't pass. You don't understand. You can't pass a bond because when you're in a small town like I am, there's usually only a few landowners that own the majority of the area, which we're fortunate enough to be one of them. If I, if we pass a bond, my property insurance is going to go up maybe. 6%, 7%, 8%. So it's impossible to pass one. It's not spread out like it is in in uh, metropolitan areas. And so, um, but they, their drinking, st or a, a new um, uh, um, treatment center would cost about $12 million at that time to build. And they, they, were, they were getting fined every day from the EPA. Some were getting fined at two, $3,000 a day because they couldn't be compliant. So we luckily, just stumbled up on a piece of equipment that we started reverse engineering and figuring out how to make it a potable treating system. And then we, we figured out real quick it could be compliant and we could make these municipalities compliant. And man, it went gangbuster. In 18 months, we went from nothing to operating in 30 different states. And the thing mm. is just just growing at leaps and bounds. People are renting this equipment off of us for eight to ten thousand dollars, eight to twelve thousand dollars a month. These small municipalities loved it, uh, and it, it was it was working for them. And then the EPA showed up in my office on it was either Monday, Tuesday. I'll just say Monday. I don't remember exactly what day it was. It may have been Wednesday. I don't know. But sure. they they showed up and they want to know if this is our equipment. They had a picture of our equipment. I said yes. And he said, you know, you're out of compliance. I said, I'm not out of compliance. Uh, I said, I don't know what state that is, but we meet we deal with all the states. You know, the states have their own environmental agencies, uh, either the, you know, Arkansas. Uh, I don't I don't know what Arkansas calls theirs, but for instance, Oklahoma's DEQ Department of Environmental Quality, and then everybody else has their own state EPA mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I said, we're, we dealt with every one of these states. We're in compliant. We had never had a single fine, zero. We had never had a single fine ever. And uh, and they said, well, we changed the rules. The, 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 the Obama administration changed the drinking water standard, which is what led to Flint, Michigan, by the way. If you guys want to get yeah. into that, we can get into depth on that, why their water is discolored. But they put me out of business in just a few days. In a few days, we were we were going. We had self financed because once I got out of debt, I never went back into debt. So we self financed everything. But if I was like any other company, startup company, I would have financed the house on this. I would have financed everything. And some faceless bureaucrat made a decision to change the regulation, not legislation, change the regulation, and it literally put me out of business. It didn't bankrupt us, but it definitely hurt. We had invested seven figures big time in this thing, and we never got our money out of it. Um, I, I thought we have a saying in the family, you're never going to change anything you're willing to tolerate. I've said that forever. You're never, a lot of people gripe about stuff. Mm -hmm. My saying is if you're going to gripe about it, then do something about it. If you're not going to do them something about it, then shut up. Okay. Just, just why, why would you waste your time griping about something you're really not going to do anything about? Right. Yeah. So we have a saying that says you're never going to change anything you're willing to tolerate. And I used to write that on everybody's desk, especially when I had a manager that just complained about everything. And, um, and so I came home and I complained about it. And my wife goes, are you running for office? I said, what? <laughs> oh, heck no. And she says, uh, you are, aren't you? And I was like, no, absolutely not. And then just out of nowhere, doors started opening up. I said that was the Lord effect. Doors started opening up. I said, no, said, no, said, no, said, no, said, no. 
And then the guy who had the seat that I lived in in the district, Dan Bourne, who was a Democrat, but a good guy, like really liked Dan, still get along with Dan Bourne. He was a moderate Democrat. He was an Oklahoma Democrat. And um, he, uh, uh, he announced he wasn't running for office. And so I made my trip up here to Washington, D.C., didn't own a tie, didn't own a suit, didn't know how to tie a tie. And within two weeks, I was in the race. You tie a heck of a tie. I don't see a dimple like that often. It drives me nuts. I, I, this is that OCD. I, <laughs> I And I did this the first try, by the way. I knew it was going to be a good day, but if I don't have it right, I keep redoing it. I can't stand wow. it. And certain ties tie a different way. It, 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 it's still yet. Yeah, I've still only bought four ties in my life. Okay. Uh, out of 10 years, I only bought four ties. Dan Bourne had a ton of ties. And when he left, he said he's never going to wear a tie again. So he left me literally two bags, bags yes. of ties. And I still wear his ties. <laughs> I'd love to see what you can do with a pipe wrench if you can do that with a tie. Uh, do you, this might be a good time, and then I'm going to let Christy get into yeah. something uh, more policy-related. Uh, did you ever get a chance to meet James Inhofe, uh, Jim, who you yeah. took the uh, seat from? Yes, sir. Jim was a uh, um, a gentleman that I called, uh, I, I compared him to my granddad. I, 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 when I first said that to him, he was like, he, I thought he was going to get offended. I said, no, sir, I mean that in an affectionate way, because he really did a lot of time, spent a lot of time mentoring me. Uh, I didn't know anything about politics. When you don't know anything about politics, you're destined to make a lot of mistakes. And I've made a ton of stupid mistakes. I've inserted my foot in my mouth so many times. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I've just decided that's just part of life. But Jim would always mold me through that. Uh, I've had uh, I've had several mentors in politics, and Jim was one of them. And so he and Kay, his, fam- his wife Kay, and then, of course, uh, his family, just wonderful people, uh, and, uh, and so we, we've, we've spent a lot of time together. Let me tell you a little story. I was in his office around 2003, and he was giving a tour of what he does to a bunch of high school students. And at the end, one of the kids raised his hand, and he said, I'd like to become a senator someday. Do you have any advice for me? And I'm paraphrasing what uh, Inhofe said here because it was so long ago. But essentially he said, the best thing you can do is get out in the real world and start working. The Senate doesn't need any career politicians anymore. What it needs is people who understand how the real world works. Right. Some of the best senators I know have started their own businesses, kept a payroll, understand what it's like to be a citizen. And after 10 or 20 years of that, you'll understand how the laws work. You'll understand the people who have to live by these laws then you'll be ready to come up here and really do something that matters. And those words have stuck with me for 20 years. Couldn't agree more. I tell, I tell, I tell people the exact same thing. I, I, I got a quick Jim Inhofe story, too. He, so sure. I, I, um, my wife always wanted me to be clean-shaven. Okay. I mean, like always. You wear I a heck of a beard, beard now, I got to say. I just trimmed this thing down yesterday, but she always wanted me. I'm talking about, like, I would shave before I came to bed. <laughs> And uh, I, I used I had to go do something overseas one time. I, I, I there's another side of my bio that I don't ever talk about, nor will I. But I had to go do something overseas. And when I went over there, I always let my beard grow out for, and I'd start letting it grow before I went. And I came home, and I'd been gone for a while. And mm-hmm. I came back, and um, I always, when I do these trips, I always come back and shave my beard. That's the first thing I do. In fact, I let my kids butcher it, and then I would. Oh, and that's then I cool. Would, yeah, then I would shave it off. And I shaved it, and she looked at me, and she said, what would you do? I was like, I shaved my beard. She was like, I kind of liked it. And I was like, who is he? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I've been gone a long time. I get it. <laughs> but uh, who is he? And so I've always had, I've carried a beard ever since then. Well, Jim saw me, I don't know, just a, a, a couple of months after that. And uh, we were in, the, maybe just a couple of weeks after that. And I was, we were in the jetway, and I had a ball cap on. Now, we're a ball cap quite a bit. And I had a ball cap on, and he looked at me. And he hadn't seen me with a beard, and he hadn't seen me with a ball cap because I was traveling to D.C. He said, are you getting a divorce? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I had been gone. <laughs> Do you know something I don't know, sir? And he goes, no. He says, the only time I ever see someone grow out a beard and with a ball cap is when they're going through a divorce. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> sir. <I'm not." laughs> he was so concerned. He called me three times that week to want to make sure everything was wow. good with Christy and I. <laughs> That's amazing. Christy, do you want to get into some of the, as I say, day-to-day that uh, the senators have to deal with up here? By the way, my Christy, not you, Christy. <laughs> yes, great name, great name. Um, well, sure. So one of the things that's been in um, sort of the, the news the past few days, or, and it's actually it's in the news every day and every week, is well, there's a lot of conversation about energy. Uh, there's a lot of conversation right. about energy prices, about energy production, about energy security, about national security. We, we just had two years of since Biden took office. 
within his first week, he canceled the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, he set a moratorium on energy production on, on federal lands. We know that we were on track to produce 14 million uh, barrels of oil per day in America in 2020. As of 2022, we're, I believe, uh, 2 million barrels short of that, so our production has actually declined. 19 months into office, Biden had leased the fewest uh, federal acres for energy production of any president since World War II, so we've really seen a halt in energy production. And so as a result, uh, or one thing that has led to this result is now energy prices are up 33% since Biden took mm. office in two years. I understand this is something you've paid attention sure. to, that you have solutions to. I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're thinking about in this space. Well, you can't you can't have a reliable and affordable inter, uh, economy if you don't have reliable and affordable energy. If you sh if you sh if you show me a country without uh, reliable and affordable energy, I will show you a third world country. And and energy is the backbone of every economy. It's where inflation lives. And it's where inflation dies. You you just look at the numbers. Just keep that in mind. Uh, Biden came in office with 1.4 percent inflation, even though he takes no blame. We're at 13.5 percent inflation today. Mm -hmm. uh, day one, he stopped at the Keystone Pipeline, which would have delivered 800,000 barrels of, of crude oil per day to, to our refineries. Take that and set aside. We're not counting that. You can think about that later. But that's 800,000 barrels per day that we wouldn't be getting from Russia because we're still buying stuff from Russia because we can't find a replacement for what we're buying for them. So we're still funding the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, keep in mind that we're spending now, we're shipping over a, over um, a million barrels per day from the OPEC cartels, so Saudi Arabia, which we wouldn't have to do that. But if, if we just had the policies put back in place, just understand the production that he's cut and then understand that because the supply and demand drives cost up and we're shipping stuff across the across the, the oceans now rather than producing it he's took 100 million acres out of production he's cut a oil production by two over 2 million barrels per day that's crude oil production 2 million barrels per day and he's taken 20 over 20 billion cubic feet of gas off the market per day. Do you want to know how we're having an energy crisis? Because they're policies. But he can't help himself because that's where the Democrat Party is now. The Democrat Party has decided energy is bad, yet every single one of them are wearing something with a petroleum product base in it today. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them go to work every day and sit at a desk that's got petroleum products in it. Every single one of them sit on a chair that has petroleum products. Everyone watches a TV that's got petroleum products. Every one of them's taking transportation somewhere that's running on some type of petroleum products. You can say it's an electric vehicle or not. Well, your electric vehicle that you're charging isn't 100% electric. It has, it's got a petroleum product all in it too because the batteries you put in there right. are petroleum based. And the seats you set on a petroleum base so it's just this ridiculous mindset that they all of a sudden think that they are going green when actually it, it's it costs more harm to the economy to produce electricity and electric vehicles than it does actually combustible motors and so what we're saying is since they can't help themselves let's take it out of their hands right let's let's just take the policy out of the hands of washington dc and put it back in the states where it belongs to begin with. Now we can't do that with the Keystone Pipeline, the crossing of the border. We can't, that's really a state can't handle that. That does need to be handled federal, but let's take it out of the White House then. There was no reason for him to cancel the Keystone Pipeline other than it was political, 100% political because the Obama administration, remember, they asked for the permit to be re-looked at twice. Mm -hmm. Both times it was approved. Both times it was approved. That was the Obama administration. He could have approved it any time, twice in his administration, but he punted it to Trump because he didn't. He knew what was going to happen to his left if he did that. Trump went back and had it reevaluated before he approved it. So it went through three evaluations, two full permits, one evaluation. So you can say three evaluations. And then he approved it. Day one, he canceled it. No other reason for political reasons. There was no, there was any reason for him to point at that. So I'm saying let's take the cross-border crossings out of the hands of the president. Let's put it back in the Department of Energy or FERC, DOE or FERC. Let's put it over there. Even though the president still appoints the head of those agencies, the board is a bipartisan board that's made up of that Republicans and Democrats pick. Let's put it back in their hands and let them decide if it's good for America or not. 
these are not elected officials. They are appointed. So they get to have a little bit less of a biased opinion. A little bit. They're all going to be biased, but they're going to be less biased. And then you start talking about fracking. Fracking is the renaissance to our energy independence, right? We thought we were, we thought we were out of the oil, oil and gas game. We thought it was done. And then, then we had some wildcatters. Those are the independent guys, Harold Hamm being the biggest one with Continental Resources, that discovered how to do, hors, not horizontal, but vertical uh, fracking to extract oil in ways that we didn't think was possible. That was This is the Shell Revolution. That was Shell tried, Revolution, yeah. right, fracking, the Shell Revolution. In 2013, that was early 2011? Yeah, it started, no. really started in 2009, okay. 2010. They yeah. really pre- it came mainline 20, in 2013, 2012. Okay. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, it just blew up. And we discovered we have bigger reserves than Saudi Arabia does. We have the right. largest reserves in the world at this Incredible. point. Yeah. And, uh, and, and who, was, who was permitting that? It was the states. The states figured out how to do it, not federal government. The states, because federal government didn't have the ability to even understand how to regulate it, but the states did. Mm -hmm. There were some hiccups along the way, but we figured it out. The states have handled it. Now Washington, D.C. is saying, we want a permit. It should be a federal permit. (laughs) Are you joking me? No, it's not. Let's keep it in the state. And, And choose to live in whatever state you want to live in. If you want to live in California, they want to ban fracking. Then fine. Have rolling blackouts and have the highest gas prices and highest energy prices in the nation. You want to have an energy crisis every single winter because you're still using propane in a bottle because you won't build infrastructure to be able to take natural gas to your house? Then live in Boston. I don't care. You make that decision. But if you want to be smart about it and have reliable energy without re- and affordable energy, then live in the Midwest. But let our states make those decisions. If, 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 uh, and that's what we're saying with the, with the fracking bill. Just put it, keep it in the hands of the state. Let the states, let the people of that state make the decision for themselves instead of Washington, D.C. And then when you start talking about federal lands, you know, we're not, when you, people start thinking, talking about federal lands, they start thinking about Zion National Park. They start thinking, talking about Yellowstone, not talking about the movie, the park. That's what people start thinking about. We're not talking about this. We're not talking about national parks. Where we're doing drilling. We're talking about federal lands that was taken for the purpose of drilling, for a national security purposes. So we'd always have reserves for it. They were to, when we took it as federal land, the federal government, we did it for national security purposes because the resources that was in that land that was supposed to be developed, either it was for mining or it was for natural gas or, or, or production of crude. And he's taken out 100 million of that now out of production, 100 million acres out of production. Once again, that land belonged to the state before it belonged to the federal government. Put it back in the hands of the state. Let them make that decision again because it costs the economy of that state. When you take 100 million acres out, it costs that economy in that state hundreds of millions of dollars that would have been in that state. They would have provided great paying jobs and produced so many downstream jobs from the hotels to the restaurants to the, to the manufacturing companies that's helping keep those busy to the gas stations they're filling, out, filling up at every single day. It, would, it, it, it affects that state's economy, mm-hmm. but yet we're having some bureaucrat that's hired based on diversity, not because they knew what was best for them, because they were from identified as somebody that's running our energy or our transportation or whatever it is that they're overseeing, and they're making a decision for us in Oklahoma. I'm saying get out of our way. That seems like a common sense <laughs> uh, approach to that to that issue. That's also responsible. And one of the things that strikes me is so there was an interesting story. So the U.S. actually produces, uh, you know, we are energy innovators, and we actually have incredibly clean energy production compared to all the right. other uh, where we buy our energy from. We produce it better here, cleaner, faster, cheaper at home. And so one of the stories that came out was that in England, where in the UK in general, where they've seen energy prices skyrocket because of challenges with their energy supply, is that... Uh, so they tried to go green and it didn't work. That's right. Yeah. And emissions uh, this last winter actually increased. They have one of the dirtiest years on record because people were burning wood. Mm. Right. And they actually found that it And running their generators. Yep. They're burning wood and they're running their generators because they bought into the wind and total electric. And they took out nuclear. Right. And they took out coal fire. And, of course, they really didn't have natural gas, but they tried to use some – some places had natural gas uh, plants. 
and and it's just kind of it honestly it, you just think and that's what we're going to right. that, that's what you see that you're going to when you start talking what pe- so people understand what you're talking about was we can produce it cleaner so you have a heavy crude and you have a sweet crude a heavy crude is a very dirty crude that that is produced in let's say OPEC Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. they have a very dirty crude that takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, and uh, and refinery uh, products which takes a lot more chemicals to refine where we have a very sweet crude right. in fact the condensation off a of sweet crude you can burn as gasoline and if you go back and you read about during the the 40s coming out of the war or even some people in the when we st- first started having pipelines during the great depression they would actually take the condensation off of pipelines and they could burn it as fuel in their cars our cars today can't do that but you can actually use it. that's how that's what sweet crude is it's a very easy product and so it, it is very light and very easy to refine and so much cleaner but yet we're not producing ours we're burning we're we're refining this dirty crude and the whole time they've cut production by the way we haven't cut one barrel of demand in fact our demand since biden has went in office has increased it's it's interesting production if you want to look at a production map look at california they have cut their production down in california where they're almost cut out all their production Mm -hmm. The same rate that they cut their production that they because California is rich in natural resources, crude, natural gas, mining. They California's got a they are, yep. they got a wealth of stuff underneath their feet. The amount that they've cut, they've increased in imports, and they're the number one importer of Saudi oil. So California imports more oil themselves than all the other lower forty-seven states combined. Wow. Senator, unfortunately, you are a very, very busy man still, uh, despite the little sleep you get. And so your staff is asking that you move on to your next appointment. I do want to they're thank always, you. They're always running me on a schedule. <laughs> There's so much you want to talk about today. Uh, Native American issues. Uh, we'll have us back on. We'll come back. I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Elephant in the Room. Appreciate it. And listeners, our plan is to bring you interviews like this every other week, but we don't want you to have to do any work. Let the computers do it for you. Please like or subscribe so you can sit back and live your everyday life and then be notified when we drop a new episode. Until next time, this has been The Elephant in the Room.